Okay. It's a pleasure once again to be talking to you. I just told you uh, what the outcome of is going to be. Now let me tell you why no learning is going to change the world. So you could maybe tell the story of the current deep learning revolution that we're in the middle of as people used to build entire careers out of hand designing features for like image classification or other tasks. And people also used to learn features. And for a very long time, the learning features did worse than the hand designed features. But as we increase the amount of computing we had, and we increase the amount of training data we had, and a little bit as we develop better methods, the learned features got better and better and better. And now, essentially, no one has a career in designing image features anymore. Um, and maybe the key key features that drove this was given enough data and compute, and uh, learned functions will, will outperform and design heuristics. On the other hand, we still hand design our optimizers and our loss functions and our network architectures and all of these things. And these have exactly the same characteristic as the hand design feature. Um, which is mainly that they're, they're heuristics themselves. Um, maybe just as a, as a quick example, uh, if you're writing a paper, you're probably interested in reporting uh, accuracy on, uh, on a test data set. Uh, when you train your model, though, you're probably training your model using uh, cross entropy loss on a training data set. So even if you have a perfectly theoretically justified optimizer, you're still using that. Theoretically justified optimizer to train a model on the wrong loss function on the wrong data set. So it's really it's just a, a hand derived design process. And so the hope is that as compute continues to scale and, and we build data sets of tasks rather than data sets of examples, that we will similarly be able to, to transform the way in which we do deep learning and replace this like outer shell of hand design components with, with other components. So, okay, so that's a very general statement of high learning. I think one of the most promising places we can apply it is to optimization. So let's let's review or, or introduce what a learned optimizer would be. So if you are a training model, you might initialize your model with some parameters W0. And then you're going to use some rule to update those parameters. So, for instance, if you're using steepest gradient descent, you're going to map parameters, your parameters to parameters minus some learning rate alpha times the gradient velocity with respect to those parameters. And you're going to do this over and over and over and over again until you've done like capital N training step, where capital N is like 10,000 or something or 100,000 or a million. And then you're going to measure. If you're going to look at validation loss or, or accuracy, um, maybe a flaw at a number and put it in the paper. If we are going to learn an optimizer, then what we're going to do is we are going to take this hand design update rule and we are going to replace it with a parametric function. And so this function is going to take the current parameter values and put it's going to take the current gradient of the loss with respect to those parameter values. It can take a whole bunch of other information that you think might be useful. And it is going to have its own parameters data. And so then to train a model, we need to apply this learn function u over and over and over again. And then the algorithm, after you train the model once, you measure the performance, and you compute a learning signal or gradient, like how would the performance of this final training model have changed if I um, had slightly changed it? And you use that to update data. And you train the model again, and you update the data again, and you get this outer loop where you evaluate the performance of your train model and use it to update the parameters of your optimizer. And then you have this inner training curve where you take a fixed setting of data and you apply you as an optimizer. Um, I should have said at the beginning, um, one of the joys of doing an in person talk is that people can interrupt questions. So, so interrupt early and often if you, if you want clarification or have questions or anything. Yes? Um, so that model is a software 
Um, the second row, you would reinitialize your your modulated training. Yeah, so we're going to talk about this a little more. Um, it can be. It depends what you want to do or not. So you can either train on an ensemble of tasks, or you can train on a single task. You don't need to do it earlier than that single task. Yeah, so actually one, one, one actually pretty common situation is that you have a model that you're retraining constantly on slightly new data. So, so like you have an image classifier and you have slightly new images or you have like a sentiment classifier and you have slightly new text data or, or so. So and I guess that is a slightly different problem, but it's within the other thing. Is there like an assumption about what the new model is actually be? Like is human assumption or Something that comes there is, yeah, where is the yeah. Yeah. This is an awesome question. Um, we're going to talk about general. Okay. My, my time, we'll talk about generalization. So, you have a lot of flexibility in what this function do to update your parameters to be, but just to have a specific architecture in your head, kind of the, the simple basic architecture people use for this is they will have a, a function. That's either an RNN or an NLP that takes in a sequence of scalar gradients and outputs a scalar change in the parameters. And if you're training a model that has more than one parameter, then you will just apply the same optimizer U independently to every parameter in, in the network. Uh, just as a note, most common optimizers that you use in practice. Follow exactly this this one. So, for instance, SG plus momentum takes in a sequence of gradients. It looks like a really strange RNN whose hidden state is the momentum term, and then it outputs a bunch of scalar um, parameter updates. Okay, so I told you we're not going to change the world. I told you what they are. Now let's dive into all the ways in which they are really. Fun. The first of those is that when you meta train a learned optimizer, you have nested dynamical systems. And basically, all the topologies that you can get in a dynamical system, you can now get in every single iteration step of the dynamical system. Uh, and in fact, it turns out to be worse than that, in that it's not just that the inner problem, like applying the optimizer to a task, can demonstrate chaotic or unstable dynamics. Is that the best hyperparameters for an optimizer are typically epsilon away from hyperparameters where the optimizer diverges? So, for instance, the best learning rate is often the largest learning rate for which stable, for which learning is stable. Uh, and so, the outer training dynamics are actively attracted to regions where the problem becomes bad. Um, there's, I'm going to do two illustrations of this because I think they're both super cool. So, here, what we're visualizing is uh, we're training a three layer NLP on um, this using app. So there's no learned optimizer yet. And we're doing a PCA projection of the parameter space of the NLP. So we're going to see the training trajectories um, of, of this model. And we're training this with Adam, but we're training this many different times with the same initialization and the same sequence of mini batches but with very, very slightly different learning rates. So specifically, we're going to vary the learning rate from like 0.1469 to 0.1484. So it's going to change in its third and fourth significant digit. And we're going to run this for one iteration. And you can see that all the models are basically identical. We're going to run for 10 iterations. You can see that they're starting to diverge. And we're going to keep on running this for more and more steps. And what you find is that after like 100 steps of training, a change in the fourth significant digit in the learning rate leads to a um, completely different final solution to the optimization task. And so what this means is that the solution you find in optimization is extraordinarily brittle 
to small changes in the hyperparameters. Mm -hmm. In this case, the loss function will still have been the same possible, but the like, solutions are the that is well, well, that is a beautiful point. Uh, give me give me one second. Um, so so you might think, okay, this might not be so bad because because as as Paul could observe, uh, maybe maybe all these solutions have, have identical losses. They're just like you know degenerate ways of specifying the same the same function. Um, so we can we can test that as well. So here um, we're now we're now training the same problem. So this is like I believe an MLP and MNIST. Uh, but here we're going to train a little learned optimizer. And this is a two dimensional slice through the parameter space of the learned optimizer. And the intensity indicates the final training loss that, that you achieve. And so we're going to change how many enroll steps we do. We're going to change, we're going to change how many steps we apply the learned optimizer um, for in order to train the model. And after one enroll step, you can see that the loss landscape of the learned optimizer, so this is what you want to adjust the learned optimizer parameters to minimize, um, is, is quite smooth. And you could do meta gradient descent on this loss landscape and it would work well. But as we apply the learned optimizer for more and more and more steps, you begin to get um, more and more complex structure in the. Uh, in the um, loss landscape, until by the time you just applied the learned optimizer for 50 steps, basically every pixel in this image has a completely different loss value. So if you were to try to train your learned optimizer by gradient descent on, on this outer loss surface, you would find it essentially impossible. Um, No, I mean the natural gradient will like stretch and squeeze this, but it won't. It won't get rid of. It won't get rid of this this, this noise. Um, cool. So, so how do we solve this? Um, maybe, maybe one clue is that if you look at this, there's like this incredible high frequency noise, um, which is if anything like underestimated by the image. Uh, but if you kind of squint and like blur your eyes a little bit, it looks like a smooth function. And so the best solution we found, um, which is not fully satisfying, but the best solution we found is to smooth the, the metal loss function. And the way in which we do this is we convolve the metal loss with a, a Gaussian. So um, what that means is we replace our loss function L with a new loss function fancy L. Where in order to compute the loss function of fancy L, you average over the loss function L for many small perturbations of your of your parameters, um, and this this will like spatially smooth your loss landscape. I'm gonna leave this right five seconds before you stop. There are at least two different ways that you can compute the gradient of, of this fancy L function of this of this smooth loss landscape. One of those ways is you can apply a reinforced style estimator to, to this loss, and you end up with something called evolution strategies. Um, evolution strategies is a finite difference estimator where you draw a perturbation epsilon from the Gaussian. And then you look at the covariance of correlation between that perturbation and the change in the loss that that, that perturbation um, induces. Um, I've written this a little bit differently than it's often written. I've written this in terms of the difference in the loss of theta plus epsilon and theta minus epsilon times epsilon. I've done this for two reasons. One of those reasons is because I think this makes it extremely explicit that this is a finite difference estimator. Um, just doing a finite difference in direction epsilon. The other reason is that if you ever want to use ES in practice, it is like crucially important 
that you use this form of the loss with empathetic samples. Uh, this eliminates the leading contribution to the variance and grading estimate you get. Um, and so a lot of people just implement this and then they send emails that are like, hey, none of this works. And then you always have to do this. Uh, one, one maybe just kind of the cool aside property that ES has, it's a very, very high variance estimator, but because you are taking this finite difference in this direction, it always points downhill. So no matter how large the variance in your ES rating estimate is, it will still be a descent direction. And I think this um, causes it to in practice work better than you would you would naively predict. Another way you can compute the uh, estimated gradient of the same is you can use the, the reparameterization trick. So you can um, instead sample um, epsilon and write this as L of beta plus epsilon and take the analytic gradient. Uh, and then, then you get a term that looks like this. These two have drastically different characteristics. The, um, if your loss function is smooth, then the reparameterization gradient, where you can take analytic gradients, will be very smooth and very well behaved and very low variance, whereas the ES finite difference gradient estimate will be pretty crappy. On the other hand, if your loss function has extraordinarily high curvature, then the ES gradient estimate will still be kind of crappy, um, but the reparameterization gradient will be like 20 or 30 orders of magnitude worse. Um, so you can actually see this. Um, here, we're looking at a meta training curve. So this is time in meta training, and this is the gradient variance along the meta training trajectory for these two approaches. And you can see that early on, you're in a smooth part of the loss landscape. And the reparameterization gradient, which uses the analytic gradients, is like five orders of magnitude better in terms of variance than the ES gradient. And then over the course of um, outer training, as the learned optimizer gets better and better and better, um, it's attracted to this like edge of like chaotic dynamics. And the reparameterization gradient gets maybe like you know 20 or 30 orders of magnitude worse. And the ES gradient is you know just as good or just as bad as it as it always was. Okay, so uh, yes. Oh yeah, sure. You you you're now you're now optimizing the smoother form of the uh, 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 It almost always seems to be helpful. Okay. Like like this seems to almost always help the generalizations. So problem number two is outer training is super expensive. So if you think it takes capital N steps to train a model, then naively, you now have to do capital N steps in model training inside of each of the capital N steps of, of outer model training. Um, and so, so you now have like N squared level of training. There's a few solutions to this. Um, one solution is to be Google. And, and if you think it takes 10,000 steps to train something, just run it on 10,000 machines. Um, number, number two is you can do actually some super fun vectorization tricks uh, where if you're applying the same optimizer to many models, you can like, uh, if you're using JAX, you can just do a VMAP over model to train. So you can like vectorize across models. Uh, number three, is you can do what people do when they train RNNs, which is you can do partial enrolls of the system rather than, than unrolling the inner problem for all of those steps. Um, and um, I have a specific technique which I'll, I'll try to sell a little bit as well. Um, so, partial enrolls. If you're going to train your inner problem for like, a large number of steps, what you do is you instead train your inner problem just for a few steps. You compute the outer loss and you update your outer parameters data based only on those few steps and you update your outer parameters. And then you run your inner problem for another few steps 
and based only on these terms, you compute your outer walls again and update your outer parameters again. And you do this repeatedly. Um, this is really good because you get many more gradients. You get gradients for outer training after each of these um, shorter rolls, um, rather than only once at the end. Uh, it's also really good because your gradients for each of these shorter rolls are like less pathologically um, like divergent than they are for the entire problem. However, it sucks because you now have bias gradients. So you now are neglecting the dependence of W4 on the settings of the optimizer for like this earlier unroll. So like you're losing all the cross terms in, in your gradient computation. And when people train RNNs, they mostly like just shrug their shoulder at the bias it induces. Um, this is also like equivalent to truncated batch buffer time training RNNs. So people also, people there shrug their shoulders with bias and they say it's, it's not really practically relevant. Um, but following the same pattern as, as like um, for chaotic um, dynamics, um, for learned optimizers, this is actually a fairly acute problem. And the way in which this is a acute problem is that uh, short horizon bias, that only training on shorter roles, tends to lead to overly conservative optimizers. Um, there's a great paper out of Roger versus um, uh, group by, by Yu and Ren where they, where they work this through for a toy problem, which I think is like, makes it super clear. So here, we have a two-dimensional projectile, and um, we have much higher curvature along the y-axis than along the x-axis, and we have noisy gradients. And if your goal is to optimize this function as well as you can in a very small number of steps, then what you want to do because of the noisy gradients is you want to set your learning rate very small so that you settle to the bottom of this like steep pole. On the other hand, if you want to make long-term progress towards the global minimum, then what you want to do is you want to make your learning rate quite large so that you move this way as much as possible. But this causes you to bounce back and forth along this axis and fail to settle in, in the short run. And we find this in practice when we train uh, learned optimizers. So here we're meta-training the learning rate or the log learning rate of just an atom optimizer um, applied to a simple MLP. And here we're training it with truncated unrolls of increasing length. And you can see that the shorter the truncated unroll, the lower the learning rate of meta learning learns, and the worse this optimizer will, will perform. So, so truncated unrolls are really helpful in that they let you do a play hundreds of times or thousands of times um, more gradient updates, but but they suck in that they use the slight extreme conservative bias in, in the optimizer's environment. I'm gonna pause a second. Cool. Okay. Um, we have a, a method, which I think is super cool. Um, actually, got a best paper where it's super cool, um, but, but um, which I'm not going to go into too much detail um, for, for time reasons, especially since we started late. Uh, but there is a really cool trick you can do where you can do a sequence of shorter goals, and you can accumulate correction terms from the earlier goals to, to use in the later goals. Um, and if you do this, you can come up with a gradient estimator, which is eventually a bias, which means that by the time you um, estimated the outer gradients from all of the enrolls, you end up with an unbiased estimate from, from the, the full sequence of, of enrolls. Uh, this is a small perturbation around normal ES. 
um, I'm just going to say this is normal yes, and here we add one more accumulator, um, like accumulation term. Um, I'm not going to accept the algorithm. Um, and if you train using this technique, then training both is unbiased, and so it actually gets to a lower loss, um, and it's also um, more more stable because you you are actually descending an actual gradient as opposed to to some some like vector direction which may or may not point downhill for any loss function. Okay, I'm going to talk about a next problem. Um, I should say that despite the fact that I suggested some solutions to the last couple problems, these are these solutions work, but they're also very unsatisfying. Like we're using stochastic finite difference estimators um, instead of gradients. We're like throwing away almost all the information we have about these problems, and we're wasting like we could probably use a thousand x less compute if we had better technologies for for optimizing these things. So so these really are still very open problems, even though we, we have we have techniques that move it in the right direction. Um, problem is meta generalization. So, in supervised learning, you typically need tens of thousands to tens of billions of training data points before you can expect to generalize to new data points. In meta learning, we need the same thing. We if we want to generalize to new problems, then we need a large ensemble of training optimization tasks to meta train our optimizer. Um, this is the solution to this is fairly straightforward. It's also an incredible amount of work, but it's, it's fairly straightforward, which is just build a large library of, of tasks to, to apply your optimizer to. Um, and in fact, you see the same kind of behavior that you would hope to see in supervised learning where as you increase the number of tasks that you use to meta train the optimizer, the optimizer does better and better and better on new tasks. I should say that there is one dimension where scaling is particularly challenging, and that's scaling to very large models, because it's easy to, we want to meta train on small models, because meta training is through really intractable. Um, but this means that there are no examples of like 100 billion parameter models like in the meta, meta training set. So, this is a direction in which the learned optimizers have no experience and is a direction where, where transfer is, is particularly challenging from, from small models to large models um, because of that lack of coverage. Um, there's another challenge or, or open open kind of aspect, um, which is that to get good image classifiers, we had to design architecture that had the right depth of bias. Um, we had to design CNNs. We, we now use these transformers. And the same is um, true of, of learned optimizers. We need to build architectures that both have the right and the bias and where the overhead of the architecture itself is, is not prohibitive um, for, for the application of, of new models. Um, I'm just going to add this and say you want to normalize things as well as you can so that scales are consistent across everything you apply it to. Um, and you want to give as much information as possible, and you want to have a computer memory overhead as, as small as possible. Um, and you can study those trade offs. Um, cool. I think this is somewhat reasonable timing. Okay, so now I told you 
Well, I think we're not going to change the world. I've told you what they are, and I've told you a whole bunch of problems that make meta training them and applying them very challenging. So let's take a look now at, at what they can what they can already. So one thing they can do is if you have tasks within a narrow domain, they can get extraordinarily good at that narrow domain. So here we're going to show one particular example of that, where we are going to uh, be trying to get learned optimizers to train three-layer mess. Our outer objective is we're going to try to minimize the training loss or the validation loss of the model that the learned optimizer uses uh, learn leads to. And our meta training set is going to correspond to 10 way classification problems um, drawn from, from ImageNet at, at random. And we are going to, to try to optimize the parameters of our, of our learned optimizer. So first, we can look at the behavior of this. If we meta train a learned optimizer to achieve the best training loss on this task. And here what we're doing is we're comparing the performance of the learned optimizer against a variety of baselines um, in terms of wall clock time and in terms of achieved training loss versus wall clock time on novel draws of 10-way uh, classification tasks from, from, so from, from, from new sets of, of, of classes. And what we see, first of all, is that the learned optimizer does significantly better than any of the existing baseline optimizers. Um, these particular baselines are optimized over a thousand different um, hyperparameter draws, um, optimizing learning rate decay schedules, um, beta one, beta two, epsilon, and um, L1 and L2 regularization coefficients. These are very highly optimized um, atom-based optimizers. So on this narrow set of tasks, the learned optimizer can do way better. A perhaps really neat feature of learned optimizers is that they don't have to target training loss. So for instance, you can directly target validation loss or any other downstream metric. You can target accuracy if you want. Um, you can target transfer to a new domain. You can make your meta loss absolutely anything, and it can be unrelated to your training loss and your training gradients. And so in this case, we make our meta loss equal to the validation loss. And the first observation is that um, if you look at the test loss, um, we take and we look at the learned optimizer that did the, the best on train loss, that we have trained on train loss, then you find that learned optimizer which diverges toward infinity. So this is perhaps an illustration that the optimizer you want is not the optimizer that best optimizes the train loss. That actually performs like extremely badly here. Um, and that is also true for the very well tuned baseline that also maximizes train loss as quickly as possible. That also diverges rapidly. On the other hand, the learned optimizer that's targeting validation loss um, actually does worse in terms of training loss than every other optimizer in, in the setting. Um, but uh, test loss does better, like it achieves values that are lower than any other optimizer. So, so this is cool. Um, within a narrow domain, these things just do better, and you can target things other than training loss. Once, twice. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I, 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 I left this play out because it, it's confusing, it doesn't necessarily add a lot, but you kind of have messed the training validation sense. So you have like inner and outer training validation sense. Uh, and, and you know, it, it works out, but it's big. 
be great. Uh, the other thing we're not trying to do is they can transfer to new optimization tasks better than likely to and design optimizers. So here, um, the x-axis is the relative performance of a learned optimizer to a compared to the corresponding row of Panasonic optimizer on either um, a training distribution or held out set of optimization tasks. And if you only choose the single best hyperparameter configuration across tasks for hand design optimizers, then learned optimizers typically do significantly better on, on new tasks. So they're better than any single hyperparameter configuration. Um, they're even better than any um, like roughly like 10 hyperparameter configuration, like than if you're allowed to only draw 10 hyperparameter configurations when you're tuning your, your hand design optimizer. Um, by the time you're drawing thousands of hyperparameter configurations, then hand design optimizers can help perform the transfer of an optimizer. Um, keep in mind that we're now running the hand design optimizers like a thousand times on the task, and the learned optimizer just once because there is no hyperparameter tuning. Um, so they transfer, they transfer pretty well, um, but but not not superbly well. And as I mentioned, there is a particular problem with transferring to larger scales. Um, and in fact, here we can show how they behave on, on larger scales. And, and the answer is basically, so here we're taking two problems that we have just internally implemented at Google, and we're comparing against the like standard optimization that people use on these problems. And what you find is that the learned optimizer um, does okay. It sometimes even does better in terms of training loss, but it does worse in terms of um, test loss and test accuracy. Um, and we find this for ResNet. Uh, we find this also for, for transformer style models. So, so they work when you transfer them to larger problems, but they don't work well enough to be, to be competitive on, on larger scale problems. Finally, and maybe just for fun, they're powerful enough now that you can use them to train themselves. So, so you can like take a meta training or an optimizer and then use it to train a meta training new learn optimizer. And it will train itself roughly as well as, as using Atom as the outer optimizer um, works. Um, cool. I'm going to pause for questions actually for a minute. Yes. Can you build a learn optimizer of every parameter? Can you do the same type of tuning or can you just do some parameters? Yeah, it's a really good idea. Um, we had a very good project where we tried to do that, and we had a hard time getting to learn to use standard parameters, but it, it's only a very good project. The first time we had it, I think it's the right thing to do. But it's, it's, yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you go back to the slide where you had a kind of sort of definition? Yeah. Okay, so what happens if instead of using this setup for meta training time, you can use it for meta testing time? And only one of the rows at the top. Uh, so you would train the optimizer during meta test time while learning the the uh, the, the test task. So that's what I call say meta time to me. But you're starting the uh, optimizer from just random uh, weights. So you would train the optimizer from scratch while training the uh, the test objective uh, from scratch as well. Are you imagining still resetting the inner parameters? Or no, it's just doing totally online. Totally online. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a good idea. Um, the, the challenge is that you um, often end up with a short variety of bias. So, so when you try to train, um, when you try to do meta learning purely online, then it typically learns the parameters that would have led to the best loss, like by the current training set, which are typically um, more conservative places, like things with lower learning rate than the parameters that would eventually lead to the, the best loss. So, you need some way to kind of compensate for the short horizon bias, maybe. Um, it also, um, so one thing that has worked well, um, there's actually some, there's some cool work by Paul, 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 um, out of, out of Canada, um, on this, um, 
you can um, the problem with short horizon bias seems to be specific to certain attributes of the output methods. So, for instance, if you meta train a data orientation schedule, it seems like you can meta train that online and it won't lead to, to short horizon bias problems. Where if you meta train a learning rate, you run into like really conservative, very bad things. Uh, and so, and so if you restrict your learning optimizer to handle specific aspects of the problem, that can also work really well. Uh, so what is the typical size of the learn on method by finding algorithms? Um yeah, so this is this is something that we're, we're currently pushing on. Um, the the designs that we're working with now kind of have this hierarchical structure. And so what you'll have is you'll have like tens of thousands of parameters probably in the um, like per tensor or like per per parameter. It's the learn optimizer, and then you'll have like 15 or something in the um, per parameter part of learn optimizer. Mm -hmm. I see. So you just when you compare your learn optimizer to like a field calls to the high design optimizer. So does the high design optimizer tune with the low or this one? Uh, so so yeah, so we, we've done we've done both. Um, most of the experiments I showed you we tune can tune can design optimizer just a random search because it's like least controversial. Yeah, I see. So it's, it's like in your regime, you were able to train the operator, like from the operator to train the dark provider using some gradient style of operation. And I would say, I would feel that the sort of the analogy to a kind of operator would be something like real. Uh, like you allow some level of the operator. I'm going to say something which might give me a trouble. But I'm actually pretty skeptical of basic optimization techniques for hyperparameter training. I see. Um, and I think the, the biggest reason for that, um, practically, is that um, you often find that your um, loss landscape, or even your validation loss landscape, is like very, very smooth, and then like it's a cliff, and you go like that. I see. And like, at least with the existing priors that I'm familiar with, Bayesian optimization actually handles that really badly. Like it, it I don't handles, know it handles, it handles like NP dot n next to like three. Like like it doesn't know how to how to manage that. I see. Um, but but uh, that means that people are researching all the time. Maybe you know there. Yeah. Thanks. Can I follow? Yeah. One more. So uh, I see this as a, also a degradation to learn simulator. So. In many learn simulator cases, uh, we're not, we don't care about the single step precision so much, but we care about some long range uh, accuracy or long, long time properties. And it's almost like you can also be using a similar approach to, to optimize a learn optimizer. The learn optimizer is really taking the immediate steps and uh, they just want to fit if you have any problems with that. Yeah, I think you're completely right. I think you could, you could like, think of this as like anything where you have like a new financial system with like a lot of the same parts would apply. Um, let me just uh, let me spend like two minutes giving you an advertisement and then and then we can do more more questions as people like. Um, so um, we have code that lets you define our train estimate gradients of uh, Exam and validation uh, of learned optimizers. Um, it's in JAX, it's super nicely parallelized and vectorized and all of that, such that it runs efficiently. Um, I'm going to show a two minute video because I've tried to do this slide and pull out and show some of the break. Um, but here, what we're going to do is um, rendering drives for training learn optimizer. We're going to um, specify the optimizer architecture. In this case, it's just like a little NLP that takes and creates the subframer updates. We're going to specify the task that it's going to be trained on, which in this case is a one thing layer uh, network uh, trained on fashion and mist. Um, we're going to specify the outer batch size, so that's the number of optimization tasks it tries to do in parallel during the outer training. Um, we're going to specify the outer grading estimator and then the outer um, um, optimizer. And 
Then we're going to do standard like just initialization, and then we have like a for loop for doing the actual training, which looks a lot like the standard for loop you would work for supervised learning. Um, it's going to run for it's going to do a number of steps of the inner problem, which is like outer batch size times unknown length times number of training steps times number of antithetic samples. Um, so it's going to run like uh, 640,000 steps of the inner problem. And while you're talking, it's just done that. And now I have a trained learned optimizer. And so let's see how it does. We're going to plot it against just grid searched um, Adam with different learning rates. And what we're going to find is that I think a lot of that kind of is just compiling the Jax graph. And hey, we do better than Adam. Nice. Um, and now we can look at how this generalizes. And this is a learned optimizer that's a very simple learned optimizer trained on just a single task. So we expect it to generalize horribly to new tasks. Um, and in fact, that's what we're going to find. We're going to generalize it to a two layer, um, larger MLP, and we're going to generalize it to a thousand training steps rather than like, yeah, I think like 100 about. Uh, and we're going to produce plot. And you can see that in fact the learned optimizer doesn't do any better than initial fiction on this on this new task. But the key takeaway from this is that in roughly two minutes, we were just able to lay train a learned optimizer to do a simple experiment on it. So if these things are within reach, if you are curious um, and if you are want to run experiments on them. Um, cool. So I told you these things, I told you meta learning is going to change the world. Um, I told you what a learned optimizer is, and then I told you to have all these problems, um, and so we have some solutions which allow us to in an inefficient way actually train these things, and they're starting to build practical things. I think I think we're maybe around 2010, 2011 in terms of the like deep learning timeline, um, which is a really good time to get involved if you want to like be there in 2012 when when, when they start out working, um, and we have a go live. Thank you. Stochastic 
getting second order methods to work with page edges. Um, and reasons for that are because um, to take a, a second order update step and take the inverse of your testing approximation. And the um, inverse of the stochastic approximation to a HESI is very, very different from the inverse of the HESI. Um, and because they're taking the inverse to take one over the eigenvalue. And so the like, smallest you noise know, these eigenvalues are the ones that are blown up. And, and those are the horrible we have in here. Um, but, but it does seem like over and optimizer would be the right way to like, make intelligent use of stochastic. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, the optimization of the optimizer can be on any target loss, like validation uh, errors, something like that. Yeah. So, what if they are not? Uh, yeah, so actually, it's the benefit of using ES, which is it works for non differentiable losses as well. So, like some, some technical example or just a brief loss? Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, um, the parameters need to be continuous, so, so ES needs like perturb the parameters. But but you, you can handle them. You can handle what a discontinuity is involved in. Okay. I think I'm over time. I'm happy to chat with you, but thank you. Thank you so much.